We are the tribe from the north. We're brave and we're bold. Defeating our rivals never gets old. Making our way to the Big Sky Conference. Watch out, cause here comes the silver and gold. Whoa, whoa. This is Tubbs at the Club for the Vandals of Idaho. Welcome back, Tribe from the North Brave and Bold, to the official, unofficial podcast of your number 19 team in the nation, Idaho Vandals. I am your host, Chris Hammond, and with me today, I have Alex the Boat Boatman. It's, do- it's going great, Chris. I mean, come on. 19th, 1-0. Great chance to go 2-0 this week. I'm, I'm, I'm stoked. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then we got... Mr. The Professor, Brian Marceau. How are you, Mr. Marceau? Ditto Alex plus Idaho men's basketball games are canceled this weekend, so there's no coverage I have to ignore. And then we have a special guest joining us, an alumni of UC Davis. It's going to get confusing on the show. We have two Alexes, Alex Bonzer. Yeah, you got it. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, yeah. Uh, We appreciate you coming on because, uh, believe it or not, it's a little rare to find some UC Davis fans. So excited to get interact with some. Uh, I've met you through FCS Fans Nation or, you know, communicated with you. And I was like, you know, he seems like he knows what he's talking about. Let's get him on the talk. Um, And then, of course, running the show from the shadows, producer Dammer. How are you, Dallas Hammer? I am fantastic, Chris. That game on Saturday was one of my favorite moments I think I've ever had in the Dome. Uh, You potentially drunkenly tackling me in the bleachers as we saw that Hayden Hatton touchdown. I still have a giant bruise. My my (laughs) wife and I, yes, COVID compliant tackle. My wife and I have giant bruises on our legs from where we weren't expecting it and slammed into the bleacher. Great time. I'm still riding the high of that three days later. Yeah. Well, and your your wife is a saint for one, driving us to make sure we are able to safely get to the corner club for our show, uh, letting you do it, and not uh, re-tackling me for tackling her. So <laughs> big big shout out to Mrs. Dammer. Um, speaking of it, the big damn preview that was uh, that was a good preview. Except Mr. Mar Eat Crow Marceau only one picking against the Vandals last week, Brian. Uh, we're not going to cover Eastern too much in this one, but uh, it was loud at the corner club. <laughs> how any takeaways from you on on how grateful you are for the people that missed the live reaction show? Yeah, I man, obviously I got the, the pick wrong. I've got no problem saying that those two teams are even, and that's great news in in Ida, in the world of Idaho sports because if we're being compared to a strong team like Eastern Washington, we're edging out a strong team like Eastern Washington in a game that was competitive from the first snap to the last snap. I'm fine with being wrong with my pick, man. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, you know, we're we're happy to have you, and we'll see if maybe some other people can catch up to you. And I don't know if uh, Patrick Furix Furix is on. Uh, took him forever to actually join FCS Fans Nation, and then this week he did. And under the team he roots for, it was go Eagles, go all hail Kyler Neal. So, I mean, Patrick, you seem to be our, one of our biggest fans. You're commenting on every single show. So uh, I was not, I was not appreciative of your comments. I want that known live (laughs) here on tubs at the club after a post poaching of the Eagles, but let's get into it. Uh, I'm still recovering from my voice. So I have no uh, can cracks today. It looks like we're all we're all doing tees, but there ain't nothing like cracking the sound of Montucky cold snack. Sorry, whoa, ain't nothing like cracking a Montucky cold snack. An ultra refreshing light beer born in majestic Big Sky Country. The best part is when you crack a snack, you're giving back. Montucky cold snacks donates eight percent of all profits back to local causes, even right here in Idaho, supporting organizations like the CW Hogs and the Idaho Food Bank. Yeehaw, that's freaking awesome. Montucky Cold Sacks, the light American log for Pow Pow Rippers, Gator Anglers, Pony Riders, and Badass Do-Gooders. Visit MontuckyColdSacks.com today to find out how to get your ass some snacks. 
Around the Bar, brought to you by Hughes River Expeditions. We're going to spend, I know we're doing live shows, but it was really loud at the club. We're going to do a quick five-minute max, put it on the board here. Uh, Boatman and my takes, and we'll, Alex, we'll have you kind of from the distance uh, if you caught the game. But Boatman, what were you, or sorry, Dallas. Dallas, Dallas what were yeah, your I, takes? Not Boatman. Yeah, Dallas was at oh. the club. I was at the club. I was there uh, just eight seats away from Chris this entire time. Uh, beautiful seats. Right next to me. I was honestly, a yeah, yeah, right next to you for a little bit. And before until uh, I got until I abandoned for the better seats. Yeah, big time. Just a little bit there. Uh, no, I Mike Beaudry didn't didn't play great at the beginning of the game. And to be completely honest, I tweeted after Eastern was up 14-0. I was wrong. I was totally, totally wrong. All of my predictions were wrong. We suck. Um, <laughs> luckily, I think that might have just been the rust of Beaudry not really playing a game for what two years. Uh, man, I don't, I don't want to bring the dead horse out, but I just want to say it was nice to see a quarterback that had no issues throwing the ball down the field. Uh, there were a couple throws to to Hatton that were honestly insane. Uh, luckily they converted on, on one of them and then obviously had the touchdown towards the end, but the, the offensive output was not great, but much better in the second half. I'm really excited to see where this team's going to be this week, next week, towards the end of the season when, when things have gelled a little bit, uh, some yeah. of the injuries were pretty devastating. Uh, the field goal debacle, I think has taken a bit of a shine from what should have been one of the best games in Vandal history, honestly, at this point. It's been how long since we beat a ranked team? Mm. Uh, last year when we beat Eastern Washington. Oh, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> That's, there we go. <laughs> yeah. Uh, my my takeaways from the game, I just want to get the, the controversial points out because I rewatched the game now twice. Uh, one, the missed field goal was 100% a missed field goal, and nobody's going to tell the Eagle fans that or anything different. It was 100% or sorry, made field goal, made field goal. Um, but the one thing that I think is getting overshadowed, and this is one, it's not the University of Idaho's fault. If you go to the 50 minute mark in the replay, Dennis Patch and them are literally talking about how because of COVID protocols, they're not allowed to have the cameras on the normal spots on the field they are. So this is before that kick even happened. So, yes, is it unfortunate? Yes. Is it Idaho's fault? No. That game has had 42 games played in it through three different conferences and sets of refs, and it's never been an issue before. It was a freak thing. A guy's adjusting his mask, whatever. At the end of the day, it also people like to treat that moment like it happened at the very end of the game. It happened with 11 minutes left in the fourth quarter. Both teams got three different possessions out of it. Idaho would have gotten the ball on the 14 or got the ball on the 14 yard line. They would have been better off position wise. More likely if the ball had gone through and we had kicked it because we probably would have gotten a touchback and back on the 25, they would have kicked off out of bounds again and we would have been on the 35. Or, you know, all conference, all American returner, Nick Romano, house this one. We just, we don't know. That's why I hate that people are like trying to crud that up. And then the whole thing that at the end of the game, maybe it changed how the play call worked. Yes. But if you listen to Paul Petrino's post game conference, he literally says they had a run play drawn up. But when they got to the line of scrimmage, they had an audible. Eastern went to cover zero on that third and 11 play, and Mike Beaudry audibled the play at the line of scrimmage to throw that ball. So, yes, we were going to play it safe, run the ball, and try to kick a game-winning field goal there. Eastern gave us that play. So, yes, I get that it changes a bit of the dynamic, but I think the actual impact is getting blown out of proportion, and that's where I, the things I just want to clear up from that game – Mike Beaudry got clicking early. I think I gave a little bit too much hate to Eric Berrier. He actually was re-watching it. The wide receivers were really bad, like really bad for Eastern Washington. Um, and our defensive line looks exactly what we thought they were, holding the 2019 number one offense and number two scoring offense to only 14 points and a tad over 400 yards, which is about 95 yards short of their average last season. Alex, did you catch any of this game and have any takeaways before we go full Aggie mode? Me, Alex? <laughs> um, yeah, Alex. Yeah, no. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. No, um, I just, I just saw the uh, the stat line, saw, and I can talk a bit more about how that's going to relate to the what I see for next week's game. But um, the missed field goal just so dominated all the media coverage that reached me about the um, 
or the controversial field goal that reached me about the the game. And uh, it sucks to have that happen. I, I think your take is pretty fair on that. And other than that, I didn't really have a thoughts on that. And but except what I'm yeah. holding off on. <laughs> okay. All right. I like. <laughs> it. We're gonna get into it. I, I guess what would be the most gripe though, Chris. Is if if you guys remember correctly, my score prediction on this show last week was 28-24 Idaho. I think the Big Sky owes me an apology. Owes me, like not yeah, Eastern. They do owe you. They owe me an apology. The Big Jam 20, preview would have been perfect. <laughs> exactly. So that's that's why I'm most pissed off about. Yeah. Well, and as Coach Petrino said on KTIK today, he may be a kid that went to a small school in Montana, but 28 minus 24 is still a win. <laughs> Anyways, let's yep. get into UC Davis now. 2019, actually, the professor, you're the one who fill in all these stats. Give it to the people. Well, we talk about UC Davis this year, but they're, they didn't play week one against Cal Poly the way everyone else opened up against their repeated rivals. UC Davis last season, not a secret. The team underperformed. Uh, still, They had a real rough schedule, but they are picked to win the conference. Definitely didn't happen. Finished eighth in in the, the Big Sky last year in scoring offense, 29.5 points per game, sixth in total offense, 432.6 yards per game. Defensively, they're really similar, right around the middle middle to low middle part of the pack, sixth in scoring defense, giving up 31.2 points a game, 10th in total defense, giving up 479.2 yards per game and route to a five and seven finish. That uh, five and seven should sound similar to Vandal fans because that's where we were last season. And UC Davis tied with us in conference record two. Both of us finished three and five. So maybe this is the uh, battle of 2019's teams that think they underperformed. Yeah, I know, I know for me, my personal take on UC Davis is last year, I actually had them winning the Big Sky. That's where my uh, conference vote went, was to UC Davis. I'm a big Dan Hawkins believer. I thought they that team would really get rolling and we're going to be dangerous. I thought they would challenge Eastern because I thought there were some flaws in Eastern, and obviously that appeared to be right. The thing I missed was there were some flaws in UC Davis as well. Bowman, what's kind of your quick overlook kind of on 2019 UC Davis? I, I mean, I, I kind of touched on this back on our preview show. Please don't give that a listen if you want to hear a more in-depth breakdown. Um, they had a really tough schedule. Like, like They played, I think, five or six or seven yeah. of their eight, eight, I think eight of their games or a team who finished above 500 and six of those were either a ranked team or an FBS team. And they played it close the whole time. Like they went into Fargo. And as we know now, North Dakota state's not the same team this year as they were last, but they played North Dakota state probably almost tougher than anyone else in the whole country last year. Like this team, this team, uh, I just couldn't find a way to win in the end. It just reminds me of uh, the 2017 Vandals when we lost every single conference game in the Sun Belt by less than one score. Like, like that's how it felt, and this UC Davis team just kind of fell short, um, kept coming up short, but really talented, um, well-coached, obviously well-coached um, because they have two brand-new coordinators, so uh, other teams took notice of that. So, yeah, I, I mean, disappointing to say the least, and now they've had almost a you know 460-something day layoff, so we'll see how it goes for them, and they didn't get to play week one, so who knows what they're going to look like. Yeah, and, and Alex Bonzer. You're the fan of, of this team. What was your kind of takeaway in 2019? Anything we're missing? What really happened? Is it just a tough schedule? I think that's part of it. And and I mean, you don't want to blame graduations too much, but um, I honestly believe in 2018, we had certainly the best quarterback receiver combo in the whole country. We in the whole FCS, we had Keelan Doss and Jake Mayer basically leading stat lines or close to it in both their positions. And that you know, obviously wasn't there because Keelan Doss graduated. I think I think really what the big picture here is just that the last three years have actually been a consistent level of talent except for the star factor in 2018. And so we really saw a regression to the mean that um, Dan Hawkins certainly brought this program up from like the basement of the big sky. But um, 2018, a lot of stars aligned for it to actually overperform, I think, a little. You know, in terms of performance, it was absolutely incredible, especially going to the quarters and almost winning quarters and probably going to... I'm going to say we would have beaten Maine and going on to the championship game if we had beaten Eastern in 2018. So that was an overperformance, and now we're seeing the result of that. So really this, if it weren't for COVID, I'd say this was the year where we'd see how good we really are. But even then, I'm not sure this year is going to be that year. 
So is, is there any heat on Dan Hawkins coming into this year, or are people still real big believers? I think there's believers on the whole. Um, important to note that, the, like you said, there's not very many UC Davis fans. Many of many of the supporters and the boosters, and even some of the you know people in in the department, are people who know Hawkins perfectly personally from his time at Davis or through other coaching gigs or through even played with him. Um, and there's a lot of trust there, and I think it's mostly deserved. Um, but certainly he's he's like i said he's elevated this program above the basement where it was before and so he's got a few more years where we're gonna i think before the, any sort of heat actually comes on him okay um so real real quick before we start getting back into the 2020 uc davis team that we're about to see 20 spring 2021 whatever we all get what we're trying to say this weird season is weird um an old Enemy of the Idaho Vandals making his first trip to Moscow since 2003 when he was mm. the head of the Riverside Tech Donkeys. Um, Brian Marceau, hit the people with the stats. You are definitely jumping past a little bit where I have in my head, but yeah, Dan, Dan Hawkins, his FBS career started at Boise State. That's really where he made his name. Uh, mm -hmm. Led Boise State to a 53 and 11 record over five seasons. They went two and two in bowl games, but you guys got to keep in mind that was back in the early 2000s when there were not quite the same number of bowl games there are now. So making bowl games was a little bit more of a feat than it is in you know 2019, 2020. That era went from Boise State again 53 wins in five years. No one's going to tell you that's anything but fantastic. Goes to Colorado doesn't have the same success. Now, Colorado, uh, Boatman, they would have been Big 12 at this time, correct? Yes, they were. Yeah. Big 12, University of Colorado, goes 19-39 and 39 over five seasons. Not one winning record. Did make a bowl game one year, which they lost. They were 6-7 and seven the year they made the bowl game. Co coached in the, the, I believe, CFL after mm -hmm. getting fired from Colorado. Yeah. And just uh, this is not really that important for our game other than the fact that Cody Hawkins is the – Offensive coordinator now for UC Davis, working for his dad. But there was a bit of a uh, familial quarterback issue when Dan Hawkins was coaching at Colorado, which uh, some Vandals are familiar with what that looks like. It was, of course, a bigger deal um, at Colorado. It's part of what cost him his job. And when he went back to UC Davis in 2017, um, the team went five and six overall, three and five in conference, had a big jump in 2018 where it looked like, you know, Alex Bonsner already talked about what it looked like in 2018, but they made it to the corner finals of the FCS playoffs. Easily could have made the final four. It was a miracle drive against Eastern that pushed UC, UC Davis out of the playoffs in the quarterfinals. Then last year had essentially a copy and paste repeat uh, in 2019 of 2017 where they – Finished five and seven, but and finished three and five in conference. And that, that takes us to today, Chris, where this week we're going to see mm -hmm. are we going to bounce back to something like we had two years ago? Or uh, are we going to say, look, around five and seven or a little bit above five and seven is where UC Davis resides? Yeah. Um, an interesting point. Dan Hawkins has only lost to the University of Idaho one time. It was as an assistant in his very first year in 1998, um, which we all know is the Joel Thomas game uh, down in Boise that got us to that first humanitarian bowl. Other than that, Dan Hawkins has not struggled with the Idaho Vandals, including his time at UC Davis. Um, the people that will remember the first couple episodes when we were doing this we were using the Hero Sports Bennett rank, and they actually had Idaho, I believe, at like 25 or 24 and UC Davis at 20. And we were like advertising as a top 20 matchup. Now, it was a computer ranking. It didn't count. But UC Davis handled us pretty stinking well in that matchup. Uh, combined, I don't even – I should have done the math here, but I think Hawkins' combined score against Idaho is probably something in the multiple hundreds to like 50. So – uh, it, it, it's an old enemy. He's had the best of us for a while now. Um, but hopefully it's something, this is the game we can get back. But Boatman, any, does it, Dan Hawkins being the guy coming in, add anything to the fire for you? Mm, for me, so as a, 
for for me as a as a guy who was in every single Idaho game except minus like two his whole life, yeah. But I mean, no one really knows that unless you you know are an old time Idaho fan. No one from UC Davis probably really cares. Um, and and if I remember right, people have always thrown his name around. I think people threw his name around when our coaching job came up when Petrino um, first got hired. Like that was a name that fans were throwing around. So I think. Um, no one really cares about him compared to like Chris Pearson, even though I really attribute what voice it is today to Dan Hawkins, honestly. And he's the one who got it rolling, but I mean, he's had our number. I mean, I was there in 2018, obviously Davis, California, um, is hot. It was really hot. Uh, I know, I know I sent a video to Dallas earlier of Ed Hall. Wait for it. Wait for it. Oh my goodness. Ed Hall, 2018 game did not go our way, but Ed Hall made sure that guy's game did not go his way either. Um, Ed, of course, was my roommate. And I was texting about this. I found this immediately after a game on Saturday. I was texting him. I'm like, I'm like dude, you killed a guy back in Davis a couple years ago. And he's like, I when I hit him, I thought I was going to get ejected like right away. He was like, I was wait, I turned around and waiting for them to get wait, waiting for them to eject me. Um, so he was surprised he didn't. Um, thought, hopefully, actually, Chris, Ed will be here in, in Seattle this weekend. Him and I will be watching UFC to, together on Saturday night, but he will be here for the Davis game. I'm going to try and drag him on for live reaction after the game. I'm going to see. Good. I'm going to well, try, but knowing Ed, not the easiest thing. Um, well, but yeah, I, it, was, it was. This was an embarrassing game for us. I, I mean, I, we have some guys on the team who remember that, and we've seen how Idaho responds um, last year when we, we kind of got embarrassed by a couple teams in 2018. We responded well in 2019 with Eastern and Idaho State. Um, so yeah, I think. I think some guys will remember that, and they should be fired up. I hope they're fired up. I hope they don't rest on their laurels. Yeah, well, Ed and I were dapping it up at the club, you know, poking fun at you this weekend, so we should get that on. <laughs> but, uh, uh, yeah, you're right. I forgot about that. The When we had the, the return, um, yeah. we kind of went on a revenge tour from all the embarrassments on the return. And to be fair, we got revenge on basically every team that embarrassed us, except UC Davis was not on the schedule. So is it too far removed? We'll see. Um Alex, I, uh, Bonzer. Ah, oh, God, I gotta get used to that. Just, just, go, just, just say boat for the rest of the time. So I'm just calling. Ah, I refer to boatman when I'm referring to boat. Yeah, there uh, you go. You know, you've been a part of this team. You, you covered it. You lost Keelan Dost. You lost Jake Mayer. Who are some of the the key players that we that Vandal fans should be aware of uh, come Saturday at 1 p.m. Mountain, noon Pacific? Right. Um, well, someone's gonna be taking snaps. We don't know who it is. I have no insider information, um, and I would I would share if I actually had a hot take, which I don't. Um, so there's going to be a new quarterback, and watching how they're going to be doing is with the key, of course. Um, I, I So I personally actually do think that the most likely thing is um, likely QB is Hunter Rodriguez, who was our backup last year. Um, he threw our only TD against Stanford, I believe, in his first drive ever as an Aggie QB. Um, and uh, most likely it's going to be him, and so watching how he's going to uh, he's going to do is going to be key. And then Alonzo Gilliam, um, a running back last year. Um, mm -hmm. and, I, and I think, Chris, we've even talked about Alonzo before. The deal with him is that, that he was a very good back in an offense that isn't really designed to keep the ball on the ground or sustain drives, and he didn't have the talent around him to succeed. So really watching how he does, but watching how he does based on like acceptable situations. Like, can they make first down passes to get him a third and manageable? If he does, that's going to be where he shines. And that I'm not honestly not confident that's going to happen because it ha didn't all last year basically. Um, but those are those are two keys, especially defense is a little little trickier in Davis. Maybe we'll get to that later on. Um, there are some returning returning players in defense, but um, the star power is going to be on offense, and the uh, the explosion is going to be on offense. I hope if we win this game. Yeah, but I, I do kind of want to touch on on this defense because uh, Vandal. We were a little surprised by what Eastern Washington was able to give to us defensively, and we're trying to figure out was it Eastern's defense or Idaho's offense. That that is the my obvious takeaway from the Eastern game is our offense is still a bit of a question mark, or at least it, it still appears to be a bit of a question mark. And if anybody thought that it was going to get any easier, UC Davis has more returning all conference players on their defense than Eastern Washington does. You have Devon mm -hmm. King, who's a 2019 first team all first. Team All Big Sky DB, and then Nick Eaton, who is 2019 Big Sky Freshman of the Year, and also made the second team. Eaton is an animal. Devin King is 
Like, not a guy you want to pick on. And they've had two pretty good recruiting classes where I would expect you're probably going to see a couple young dudes like a Nick Eaton. I'll be, you know, coming to fruition in this one. Yeah, so I, I'm cautiously optimistic, but uh, my concern with the Davis defense is that um, – this team is built to have shootouts on offense. The, the offense is on and off the field before you can blink. Um, mm-hmm. And so defense is not designed to, like, we're not built to hold people to zero or one touchdown or two touchdowns. Like, that's just not going to happen. It's not in the cards, um, I think, if our even if our offense is clicking. And so um, I'm looking to see, like, basically how long can they last before Idaho starts scoring? <laughs> and, um, yeah, like, hopefully there's some freshmen that step up, but their job is not going to be to... Um, be a Weber State out here. Their job is going to be to um, damage control in the first half, is how I see it. Yeah, Brian. No, what what Alex just said about UC Davis defensively is pretty again pretty on par. If you go through their defensive stats from 2019, and of course this is a new team, there are going to be some new players. But Chris, you already talked about some of, some of the big returning faces. This team defensively was in the top half of the conference in. It looks like about zero defensive stats. They were not atrocious in any area, but they're, if you look at things like pass defensive efficiency, p- total passing yards, total rushing yards, total defense, like we talked about, they're just not in the top half anywhere, which to me, I mean, it essentially is the evidence of Alex's point that look, they're not, this is not close to the worst defensive team we're going to see. This isn't Idaho State or Southern Utah, but this is not a team that is expecting to win. 17 to 21 games they're expecting to win like i picked against eastern 35 38 or you know 42 to 28 type of games so uh, i mean we don't know what to see if you see davis yet we haven't seen him but i I know from the vandal perspective i am kind of curious because i i am with you in that i don't think we know yet after one game uh what did did idaho struggle on the ground averaging 2.4 yards per carry against eastern because of eastern washington or because there's some flaws with our offensive line did i i can say i have no reservation saying we're not going to get another eight of 21 half out of mike beaudry like we did to open against eastern washington i think we can probably expect much more like the 14 for 24 he was in the second half which i think is going to bode well for idaho Mm -hmm. yep yeah, Bowman. I mean, I mean, if we can, you know, exploit um, a, an average, maybe below average defense, right? I think we'd probably just average. Um, I, I mean, I think for Idaho going forward, this is going to be kind of game that, that you need to perform on par with. For for Idaho, if you get to above thirty points, you should expect to win a game. That's how good Idaho's defense is, um, in my opinion. So if you get above thirty points a game on your out of your offense you should expect Idaho's defense to, to definitely secure that victory. And I guess my question for Alex, um, you know, how, how is UC Davis is we've talked about their defense, some of their skill positions, but how is their offensive line? How is their defensive line? Are, are they return a lot of guys in the trenches? Are they pretty young light? What's, what's that look like? Cause I think that, again, I think that's what uh, is going to come down to it a lot is how Idaho's an experienced offensive line can handle a, a defensive line and vice versa. I'm going to have to say I'm not not super uh, familiar with where the the O-line or D-line is right now uh, in the trenches. Um, I think traditionally it's been a, a uh, kind of group that, that we struggled a little bit to recruit for. Um, we did have a have market improvement in 2018, and you know some of those guys are still on the team uh, carrying over, uh, mostly in pass, in pass defense and um, sack avoidance for Jake Mayer. Uh, but I, could, I can't speak too much about this year. And again, like someone said, it's been like 400 some odd days since the last game. There have been <laughs> there have right. been basically two recruiting classes who are going to see time right. here. So I'm hoping, but there probably is going to be some inexperience on the line. That's going to be that's going to be a problem. I, I guess I guess. Oh, sorry. From that, real quick, I'll take that. If we can't find easy articles or coverage about their line, it must not be too big of a problem. It also must not be stellar. So I'm just going to go with it's probably just kind of average and where they have. It's been on par with what they've had. So okay. Well, and the real question none of us have touched on yet, we saw Cade Coffey against Eastern Washington, but UC Davis has a returning third third team, all big sky punter and Daniel Whelan. So Alex, if Idaho's used to winning the punting game, are we still going to win that? 
All right, I'm going to tell you right now, Cade's stats are very deceiving. He had a terrible game, and he'll tell you that as well. He got extremely lucky on Saturday. I, I was I was sitting next to Austin Rico for most for like the entire game, and him and I would take out our phones and time every single hang time of Cade's. He only broke four seconds like once. He got extremely lucky. Great coverage team. That boat that that's what speaks well there. You know, no better place to have a punting duel than the dome. Um, I've been texting Kate. I'm like, get your hang times up. I tried to watch a little film for him this week, see what I could see. Um, but I, I did listen to kind of talk about punting though and field position. Man, Cade, Cade was a weapon in that aspect. Um, anytime, anytime you can ch- flip the field. 50 50 just right away you know go from your own 20 yard line to the other team's 15 yard line like he did this last weekend yeah it's it's huge it helps your offense it helps your defense you know i remember when i was i was on the team our coaches they break down scoring position um chances of scoring from where an opposing drive starts so for example if you put a team inside their own 10 yard line they have like a 90 percent chance they're not going to score and they're gonna give you the ball back that's off of just historical averages. So if you can do that, that's that's really tough for I, an opposing team to deal with. I just loved how Cade Coffey's average was more than Eastern's long. He averaged like 50.3 and Eastern's best, punt long was 49.7. Best ball of the day, though. That Eastern Cade hit his 61. best ball of the day. He hit a massive ball, his best ball of anyone that day. It was beautiful, but then he also shanked one right out of bounds like for 10 yards. So – Hate to see that for the average. That's always killer. But yeah. hope Kate hope field goal situation at Idaho is an interesting situation. I maybe we can talk it about is. that. We didn't really get to see. We thought we'd get a second attempt <sighs> at one there, and we didn't. And uh one thing to count, Kate Coffee did not take that field goal attempt yes. that he missed. It was Prescott. It was Logan Prescott, and from what I've been told or heard is that um Prescott has handled some kicking in practice. They've both both have kicked in practice. Um, Petrino likes Prescott. And as we, I talked about in the preview show, Logan Prescott had like a 23 out of his 28 kickoffs last year for touchbacks. So the kid has a leg. Um, and I, I've heard that Prescott will handle potentially 40 plus field goals and that Cade will handle anything under 40, 35 area. So Petrino is not known for kicking long field goals, but he might, um, be more in the mood 48. I think that 48 yard field goal was the longest Petrino has attempted like in four years. Yeah, so well, that that I thought it was interesting. We we came from a two quarterback system. We have to go to a two kicker system. I mean, something has to give. Some, yeah. Something has to give. Uh, real quick, uh, from the Vandals on this key Vandal players, um, just give me one guy you want to see uh, be important in this game. Boatman, um, Roshan Johnson. You need to step up the running game. Want to see a bigger game out of Roshan? Um, hopefully, the line can block for him. Brian Marceau. Boatman stole mine, so I'm just going to go with Nick. <laughs> I'm going to go with Nick Romano, which it, the, the whole point being that against Eastern, look, Idaho, we we all expect we all expected Idaho is going to look strong on the ground from day one, and that was absolutely not the case against Eastern Washington. Trey Walker was our most effective running back, getting 28 yards on five carries. Everyone else averaged fewer than three yards per carry. That goes mm-hmm. for both Nick Romano and Roshan Johnson. Uh, for us to be as strong as I think we can be. Look, we're going to be able to ride Mike Beaudry, I think. Again, I think we're going to see a lot more of the Beaudry we saw in the second half than we saw in the first half. But I think for this team to be as good as we we all want and believe it could be, we have to see better production on the ground. Yeah, and for me, it's going to be Chad Bagwell is apparently going to be out for a while. Uh, and though I space on the name, but the center that came in. Grayson didn't... Harwood. Thank you. Did an She's admirable freshman. job. Is some of those snaps a little rough? I mean, you look at that last drive. One, if Beaudry's not 6'5", it goes over his head, and that game could have ended way differently. Yeah. We were lucky to even get a yard out of that one. So just, I mean, I get that he probably hasn't had the reps. So hopefully that's one. I think he's going to be a big key in this because I think UC Davis is might be able to take advantage of some of that stuff. Um Moving on to keys of the game. What does everybody think they're going to need to see from UC Davis for them to come away with the win in this one? Boatman? Speed, speed, speed. Um, I vividly remember UC Davis operates extremely fast on offense from a couple years ago. And listen to Alex, they continue to do the same thing. Um, With new OC, we'll see how that changes, how quickly he is – 
how quickly Cody Hawkins is at getting the next play in. Um, if UC Davis can operate that same offensive speed, keep teams from subbing, um, that's huge because guys get gassed. And we saw Idaho have multiple guys cramp up, multiple guys. Trey Walker had to get an IV. That's how that's how cramped he was. Christian Ellis cramped up. I think we were at one point, I think Fave Fave cramped up. We were down like, like our three-story linebackers were all cramping at one point, not in the game in the third quarter. Um, and that dome gets hot. I think hotter than people realize. And we should be used to that because our guys practice and play there every day. So every time we cramp up, I get I get pissed off because it's, it's an avoidable thing. So if UC Davis can play with speed, keep us from subbing on defense, um, it, can, it could be a long day for the Idaho defense if they're not ready for that speed. Alex Bonzer? Yeah, honestly, I think I said it before. I really want to see what happens on, on the, uh, the – um... I don't know if it's officials that the first down efficiency. I want to see uh, the new QB and the the um, new new OC make good play calls on first down. Just get get four or five yards, just short passes, whatever it takes on first down. That was not happening last year. A year before that, that wasn't actually happening either. But we had a great third down receiver who could make any catch 10 yards, 15 yards, whatever you needed. Uh, we won't have that this year. We can't count on that. So I just need to see uh, setups on uh, on first and second down for good um, consistency uh, on third down. Uh, for Alonzo Gilliam, just two or three yards. And and if that happens, drives get sustained. If drives get sustained, defense stays off the field, their efficiency gets a little little higher, and um, that's where we win the shootout. It's going to be close, I think. If, if Davis wins, it's going to be close. If Davis doesn't win, it's probably not going to be close. So that's what I want to see. Brian Marceau? I want to see – obviously, we're going. this is the story for every team uh, that we're going to play from here on out because Eastern Washington's only team with a returning starting quarterback. Curious to see the transition of both potentially Hunter Rod. It's Hunter Rodriguez, correct, Alex? Yeah, yeah new quarterback Hunter Rodriguez plus new OC um, <clears throat> Cody Hawkins. Curious. This is maybe like the worst year to have to have both those things starting over. But you know what? UC Davis is supposed to be a good academic school, so maybe they're the school I can theoretically handle it. I don't know. I know that's generous. And follow that up with. Alex has talked down Alonzo Gilliam a bit. And just so listeners know, dude had 1,600 total yards between rushing and receiving last year. He was their number one receiver. He had the he led the team in receptions with 57 last year, led the team also with 11 rushing touchdowns. I, uh, I accept that he's not going to win a game on his own, but he's definitely one of the best returning running backs in the league. And he is a dual, he is a dual threat, one of the best dual threats in the league. And I, I'm curious to see what kind of footprint he has this year. Is it going to be similar to last year, or are they going to rely more heavily on their returning all big sky running back? Yeah, and I was going to say, one of my key to the game is right here. Do what Eastern tried to do to us. We know that UC Davis has a run game. Alonzo Gilliam is going to be deadly uh, in this game. Make the new unproven quarterback beat us with his arm. I, I think that is our best way to win. And then ho- you just got to, as an Idaho fan, hope that Cody Hawkins is an even worse offensive coordinator than he was quarterback, and he tries to air it out 57 times like Eastern instead of giving it to their stud you know, why, running back that could be an All-American. He, this the Alonzo mm-hmm. Gilliam is that good. He is knocking on All-American status. If he gets a good year, probably not first team, but like if he has a good year, he can do it. And he's still, I believe, a junior. So he's going to be around for this free season, all of next season, uh, and then another season after that. So he's not going anywhere either. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Moving on to keys of the game for Idaho, Boatman. Yeah, um, I'm going to have a couple here. One is can Idaho stay healthy? Um, we've already lost. Jermaine Jackson, um, knee injury here, and he will not be back this year, uh, potentially. Um, not good. Not good to lose your number two receiver <laughs> on a kickoff return, who was really – his one return really explosive, almost broke it for a touchdown. Yeah, um, kicker's also, helmet's Chad, what brought him down. Also, Chad Bagwell, um, starting center. And if you listen to Petrino's comments from even in the fall and the spring, Chad Bagwell was like one of the two for sure starters on that on that pretty an experienced offensive line they were definitely starting so that's a that's a huge loss for Idaho and then also take care of the cramping issues on, on both sides of the ball from your skill players we can't afford to have Trey Walker in, in the locker room get an IV for you know a whole quarter of the game 
And then I'm going to flip, flip the script, go back to offense here, run the ball. Um, I think – so here, here's – I think our, our run game kind of had some issues last week, obviously. But the reason is, is Petrino has given Beaudry license to audible, as we know, because he audibled out of that third down play to throw um, that fade to Hatton. So Beaudry has the license to audible. Petrino also, in the last quite a few years, calls a lot of RPOs. Calls He calls a lot of RPOs. I think Eastern pretty much said, hey, we know you run five yards on average with these two running backs. Please beat us with your your new quarterback's arm. And that's what they did. They made Beaudry try to beat them, and they were successful at first. I think they made sure they stacked the box against us and made sure that Beaudry had to throw. Um, so if UC Davis now knows that Beaudry can throw and can beat them, will they will it open up some lanes for us to run the ball more? Um I hope so, because if we do, then it's going to be a long day for UC Davis. Also, please go out as under center more, Petrino. I was killing me. I, was, I think we went out under center two times against Eastern. It opens up play action so much more. Um, so, yeah, anyway, that's 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 my keys. Run the ball, stay healthy, deal with injuries. Alex Bonzer, what do you think Idaho needs to do to be able to beat your Aggies? Um, just get a little bit – well, first of all, be second half Idaho, not first half. Uh, the passing game department anyway. And um, second, um, just get that rushing average up. Um, not even that much, but just some. Um, just any sort of dry, sustaining of drives, any, keeping the Davis offense off the field, keeping the defense on. Um, there is not a difficult formula to beat UC Davis. There wasn't last year. There wasn't really the year before that, just we didn't have as good of opponents. Um, and so I, so I think it's just, just make that rushing numbers an anomaly against Eastern, mm. basically. Mm-hmm. Brian Marceau? Yeah, to contextualize it, our defensive effort against Eastern Washington, Eric Berrier averaged 5.9 yards per pass against us. The best passing defense in the league in terms of yards per pass last season was Sac State, giving up 6.8 yards per pass. So that was a great – even though Berrier had 356 yards, took him 57 throws to get there. 57 times, yeah. Yep, yeah, 57 throws to get there. So, And that's – hey, that's the best returning quarterback in the league, preseason, all big sky, no question. Probably if the country. We, if we yeah. see that – so that type of, of defensive effort we saw is re, – that's what you compare to Weber State. Similar with our how we did on the ground. Eastern average 2.7 yards per rush. That would have been better than what Weber State gave up on average last year per game. Weber gave up 3.1 yards per rush last year. They had easily the best rush defense in the league. If we're going to have a repeat defensive effort like that, the offense has to just be marginal and we should be fine. I think we're going to see, I think we're definitely going to see a better result out of the running game because it's pretty hard to do worse than the 2.4 yards per rush we had against Eastern. Mm -hmm. And I, again, I just don't, it was how bad Beaudry was missing in the first half and then how much better he looked in the second half. You just have to think that's rust. So again, if we're going to get, if we're going to persistently get defensive storms, we got against Eastern, we just have to be solid offensively. So that's my key. Keep defense where it is. Make sure offense is stable. You won't have to worry a ton. Yeah. And, and for me, capitalize on the rust. It is no secret. You look at the teams that played last week Eric Barrier did not look good in the first quarter. Mike Beaudry looked awful in the first quarter. Weber Even State. Weber State, uh, Bronze Barron looked really good at the end, but struggled there early. Idaho State struggled there early. I think all these games were – no, Eastern was up 7-0. I think Weber and Idaho State might have been 6 or 7-0. It was close at the end of the first. It took a little bit. It's been 400 days for most of these players to get clicking – that paired with the fact that UC Davis didn't have a game last week, uh, they have just maybe a little bit more rust than Idaho does. So you, you're going to have to jump on it early because you have the defense to probably stop it. Um, I, I think that is going to be so crucial because if not, I think I called in our preview show. I think this is a trap game. I know it's weird to say it's a trap game when UC Davis is like 27 in most polls, like just barely outside the top 25. But they are basically where Idaho was against Eastern. We are five and a half point dogs outside the top 25, playing a number 12 team. Idaho is number 19 and four and a half point, or yeah, four and a half point favorites against UC Davis. This is very eerie to what ha- we did last week to Eastern. So just if we can capitalize on Rust, I like our shot. Um, score predictions. 
Boatman. 35-21 Vandals. Um, yeah, if Eric Berrier can't put up more than 14 points against the Vandal defense, it'll be tough for me to see UC Davis putting up uh, more than 21 um, coming off of 470-day bye. So, plus offense gets rolling a little bit more. Alex, you, you taking your Aggies in this one? I'm taking them. Um, I'm going... 30-28 Aggies. Uh, it's it's going to be close, though. It's going to be a one-possession game. If, if, if the Aggies are doing well, it's a one-possession game. I also want to just just to comment on the rest thing. Um, fun fact, UC Davis was one of the few FCS teams that got in a spring camp last year. So admittedly, it's only a 300, <laughs> 300 day instead of 400 days. But um, they had to move their spring camp to uh, allow the players to study abroad, just kind of going back to the academic kind of focus they always okay. do. Mind. But um, definitely going to be rest. So... We're not scoring mm. more than 30. Yeah. Professor? Again, Alex absolutely steals the score I wanted to go with. So I'm we'll going to go with you next week. Th- I'm yeah. going to go third. Well, just so that I can throw a little bit, l- something a little bit different, I'm going to be controversial and go instead of 35, 21, 38, 24. We're going to see some made field goals in Idaho game someday, guys. I'm not that scoreboard has anything to say about it, Brian. <laughs> uh, I'm. God, I I like very friskily want to pick UC Davis here, um, but I am terrified to have what happened to Boatman last week and have Crow thrown into me for nickname. I'll go. Let's go twenty eight twenty four. You take my score from last hey, week. Chris, All right. can we spend 20 seconds going over why it makes sense for you to be have reservations about the follow-up game? Yes, please do, Chris. Yeah, <laughs> well, because last year I yeah. predicted we would upset number 11 Eastern Washington, and I did it on our preview and the this show when we were previewing just that game. I said we would lose to Northern Colorado. Everybody said I was crazy. We just beat Eastern. How are you going to lose to arguably the worst team in the big sky? And we did it. So I am hesitant here. Um, but it's a different team. And I'm positive vibes only for this season. Mm-hmm. Let's go. Well, it's a it's a different team, Chris. And it's just we've talked before about how Idaho does have – if things go well, Idaho is going to prove that we've turned a corner on a couple things. And that is what you're talking about is a pattern that if we don't win against UC Davis, we'll be perpetuating, which is what we saw last year, getting up for the big game against sorry, beating Central Wa- beating Central Washington barely, barely losing to Wyoming at Wyoming when we should have, beating ranked Eastern Washington, losing to Northern Colorado, hanging tough with a real good Weber State team, then getting killed at Portland State. I think this team absolutely can turn can show that that is a part of year two transition and it is not part of this team's DNA. But Chris is right to say until we see that happen, it's it's not unreasonable to be pretty mm-hmm. cautious about a game for Idaho coming off a big win. And have we put together a win streak at all in the big sky since our modern return? I don't think we have. So this would be two things. It would be only our it'd be our first win streak. Oh. Oh. We do. Well, Chris, I'm going to forgive you for forgetting this uh, because you're probably blacked out for two solid weeks. Mm-hmm. We beat consecutively the powerhouses, Idaho State in Moscow on October 19th. Then we had a week off and beat the other powerhouse of the big sky, Cal Poly, 21-9. to nine. That's true. We were on a two-game. And technically, we're on a two-game win streak right now if you go back to last season. So. I was double wrong. I'm just going to be shut up and have Dallas save us here. Dallas, what's your prediction for the game on Saturday? So you guys aren't going to like me, but I'm going 28-27 UC Davis. I don't think it happens. I said in our preview show, Idaho was going to lose two games, UC Davis and the second Eastern game. I have seen nothing to make me think that is not going to happen again. Uh, Everybody's talking about the defense played really well. Eastern's receivers dropped a ton of balls that they should not have dropped. And if a team that's returning their four top receivers from last season, if those guys can hold on to balls a little bit more, this game's going to be closer than than I think we think. And that terrifies me. That plus the the good old Idaho letdown. Uh, I just don't have good feelings about this one. 
Yeah. Now you're making me even less confident in my pick. Hey, I'm, I'm going to tell you something real quick, though. Idaho, since they've been back on the big sky, at home against conference opponents, eight and four. So It's true. Only, We've held close only, in every game at home. Only losses coming to Montana in 2018. Yeah, that's true. That was a bad one. Weber State, 2019. Sacramento State, 2019. And I might have been wrong. I think we only lost just three. three. And, yeah, just three. We're eight and three. At, excuse me. We are eight and three at home against conference opponents since twenty since our first year back in the big sky. Um, and then two of those were against teams that split the conference title last year. Yeah, so our only losses have come to Montana um, and then two top four teams last year. So yeah. I do have hope. that I'm, I'm happy that we caught UC Davis at home going into this. An eight and three – Idaho team at Big Sky. Petrino gets his guys up for home games for some reason. That Idaho, we we've hung with teams that we shouldn't have um, that made no sense, and then lose teams that we that we should have beat on the road. So yeah. I have I have hope and faith. Yeah, it's worth but, noting, Alex, that look, we got destroyed by Montana year one. That was and, the only one we got killed. Sac State. Uh, no, yeah, dude. Sac, Sac State. State. Sac, Sac State was bad. Sac State held us to as few yards in the first half as Penn State did. Uh, to open the season. So those two are pretty ugly, but those are two, those are two pretty, well, actually Montana wasn't that strong. So maybe that kills my thread. I was going to say we're against teams that are like mid level in the conference to lower. We haven't laid eggs at home. So look, that's still yeah. reasonable to say we're not getting killed by awful teams at home. Right. And I think Alex, uh, our, our guest, Alex, there's no way he's probably calling UC Davis a threat to make the playoffs this year, or may, maybe he is. No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, all right. Well, we that was Around the Bar brought to you by Hughes River Expedition. We are going to get into getting iced. Alex, that is when you get to ask us any question you want. It can be sports-related or not. We're going to give you a second to think about it. We're going to do our ad read for Hughes River, and then we'll come back after that, and you get to hit us with whatever you want. Let's see if I can do this ad read a little bit better uh, now that uh, I've had a couple takes at it. If you are looking for a great all-inclusive week-long vacation, don't look past your backyard. Venture into the largest protected wilderness in the continental United States, located right here in the great state of Idaho. Enjoy a multi-day trip down the middle fork of the Salmon, the main Salmon River of No Return, the Salmon River Canyons, or the Selway. And you can even enjoy special trips like the one to see the Perside Meteor Shower, camp on pristine beaches, run amazing whitewater, hike scenic trails, spot wildlife, soak in beautiful natural hot springs, and take in the history all along the river's edge. Oh, and while you're at it, fish some of the most remote stretches of river in the entire country. Just bring your clothes and let HRE handle everything else. A huge river expedition has been vandal owned and operated since 1976 and ready to take you on a vacation of a lifetime. What are you waiting for? Find out what it's like to grab a paddle, catch dinner, and ride the bull all throughout the Gem State. Call them now at 800-262-1882 or check them out at HughesRiver.com. Getting iced, Mr. Bonzer. Hit us with it. What do you want to know? You've been on the hot seat okay. all day. <laughs> okay, say deep in the Idaho wilderness, there's a mascot Hunger Games. Now, <laughs> the mascots don't actually die because that would be animal cruelty in case we're Weber State and a few others, but but which which Big Sky mascot wins the mascot Hunger Games? Mm. Ooh, Dallas. I mean, I would go Joe Vandal just because of the opposable thumbs. Um, <laughs> and he's axe. slightly in the helmet. He's slightly terrifying. Yeah, I mean, I would have to go Joe Vandal. I know that's the Homer pick, but that's that's who I'd have to say. Ooh. Ooh. All right. Brian Marceau. There's a couple of routes to go, and I'm going to say in the war of attrition, the Thunderbird stays oh, out Brian. of range of oh. any sort of weaponry, Damn. picks off mice wherever it wants to safely, and cruises to a pretty low stress win while everyone else starves to death. Damn. Or kills himself. Brian. Damn, Brian took mine. But yeah, I'm going to go with the Thunderbird. He just gets the hell out of there. He can fly. Everyone else got to run. See. So. <laughs> Like I Southern know. Utah, it gets the hell out of here. Exactly. See, and I'm just thinking like you're Idaho, right? Like you, you got the Viking. The the issue is we have Vikings, lumberjacks, and vandals. So the Vikings like, are the Vikings need water, so they're so, out. 
So, like, the people are going to kind of beat each other up. I bet you at some point, like, the Viking and the Vandal take over an Aggie and a Mustang and use them to fight off, like, the Grizzlies, Bobcats, Wildcats, Eagles. But I do think you're right. I think Southern Utah is a tough one because though there is an Eagle in this conference in Eastern Washington, I just feel like the Thunderbirds, like, you know, mystical. It, it's got, it's like a god. It could probably summon some crazy ability where Eastern just has like a regular old eagle. We don't even know if it's a bald eagle, a golden eagle. So I think Thunderbirds, the move, because the people would just beat each other up. They're, they'd be riding the horses. The horses would probably go down. The lumberjack is nowhere near as equipped as a Viking or a Vandal. They at least could wear armor. So the lumberjack's going to get wiped out real quick. Two bears. Two bears. The bears are just going to like grizzly versus whatever kind of like, I mean, don't get me wrong. It, it would be a death match, but I think the two birds would be up there and then the Thunderbird would just be like, Ka, and then it'd be over. Well, and Ty goes to runner on the bird thing too. Thunderbird citrus wine is the worst alcohol in the history of alcohol, which <laughs> gives a couple extra credit points to the Southern Utah mascot. And when I say it's, Look, it is even worse than our namesake, Idaho Gold, Idaho Silver. And you might be wondering, how is that possible? Just give it a try. Alex, did we get it right? Uh, those were some good good picks. I'm curious, on the War of Attrition front, nobody thought about the Hornet, which no one would even be able to find. Then again, I don't know how long they live. Um, one but, thing doesn't uh, die, so... Thunderbirds. Yeah. 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 Very good. Thank you, Ryan Phillips. <laughs> so true. Um, all right. Let's get into watching the TV real quick and wrap this puppy up because we're getting at our time marks. Uh, so we're going to pick the rest of the big sky. Idaho versus Southern Utah boatmen. All right. Or Idaho State versus Southern Utah. Sorry, Idaho State. Yeah, the Bengals. Okay. First of all, I went 2-1 and one against the spread last week. We're going to keep on try to keep on that trend. You know, good oh, teams win, great them. teams cover. We're rusty, yeah. too. It's been okay. 400 days for us okay. as well. I'm picking against the spread here. Idaho State, three point, three and a half point dog last time I checked. This is a tough one. Idaho State, something you talk about. I'm, I'm going to go, I'm going to go with the Bengals. I just, I just got a little soft spot in my heart for the Bengals to cover the three and a half and went outright. So that's how oh, that's tough. But yeah, go with the Bengals. Uh, Alex? Well, I have a simple formula for teams that just played Weber. And that is to multiply their score by two. So uh, <laughs> I'm going to uh, 42 Idaho State, um, uh, 30 Southern yeah. Utah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. A total producer, producer Dammer. Idaho State. I think uh, obviously they got pants by Weber, but they do that to just about everybody. Um, I still think Southern Utah's terrible. I think NAU's terrible. I don't think that game last week was indicative of two teams that are going to score in the 30s each week. Uh, I think Idaho State creams them. Mr. Marceau, this is number seven and number eight in the Big Sky Power Rankings. But is that fair? Is one of these teams better than that? Who's winning? So the answer is, yeah, it's absolutely fair. Bottom two teams in my mind. The only one threatening should be Northern Arizona for letting Southern Utah look competitive and actually look maybe even good the first quarter of that game. I hate to pick Idaho State because of how that absolute they, – they've been getting killed since like the fourth week of last season. But I have more faith in Fennis, Rob Fennessy, a uh, supporter of King Spud. I have more faith in Tyler Vanderwall, who had moments where he looked all right against Weber State. So I'm going to make it a clean, a clean sweep so far and say Idaho State beats Southern Utah. Oh, man. All right. Yeah. And I'm, I'm taking Idaho State real easy. T Tyler Vanderwall, I got faith in. I think Miller was a little bit of fluke because we forget who NAU's defense made look phenomenal at the end of last year. And the NAU's defense looked awful against Southern yeah. Utah, too. I like I, I was joking about this on I, Twitter with Lance Hartzler. They look like th – that I is supposed NAU's to be so approved, bad. and they look like they picked up right where they left off. Worse. Like, yeah. Worse 60 yeah, they look yeah. bad. I, real quick, the total in this game, Chris, 53 and a half. Over. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. So yeah. that's the um, biggest side of that. And I'll have the, I'll have the, our our full standings next week. My apologies, everybody. But last game in the in the sky, NAU versus Eastern Washington. Mm. Oh yeah, I mean this is this I mean this quick. is easy. Like like first of all, I think my biggest shock. I was looking for this line today, and I think Eastern was only a thirteen and a half point favorite. 
what the hell are they smoking in Vegas? Eastern kills them. Big bounce back week for the Eagles at home. NAU is terrible. So, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm going with Eastern by a lot. Oh, total real quick. I'm just going to give it to you. It is 64. So, do it as you will. I'm hitting the over and the uh, Eastern with the points. Um, Alex? Eastern, I really want to YOLO pick, uh, and I know some people on the FCS fan station would be thrilled if I did to say say <laughs> NAU, but it's not happening. It, it's Eastern. Uh, Mr. Uh, Dammer? Yeah, Eastern. No, no question. Uh, their offense is not going to put up 21 points like they did against, or 24 points against Idaho or against NAU like they did Idaho. They're going to, that defense, they, they might put up 60 points themselves, honestly. Yeah. 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 Boatman or Marceau? Yeah. One of the beasts. Eastern is going to walk, beast. walk all over NAU in this game. The, the interesting thing is going to be to just see how different Eastern looks versus NAU compared to Idaho. Last season, Eastern had essentially no middle ground. They, just annihilated the bottom of the conference and then had no quality wins other than they beat North Dakota. So I, okay. They had a quality win and otherwise looked pretty bad against the top teams they played. I expect we're going to see at least the first part of that pattern of walking over terrible teams repeat, but I am interested to see, get a little more context to let us know how much of, like we talked about how much of our production was Idaho and how much was Eastern Washington. This game will give us a little bit of him. Yeah, Eastern should win, but as people that have probably listened to Big Sky Big Takes t- tomorrow, or you know, if you're watching, if you're not yesterday, if you're listening, um, it could be interesting because it's outside in the snow in Cheney. Maybe something wonky happens, but Eastern should absolutely throttle these guys. Uh, what FCS game are you watching this week, Boatman? Yeah, this one I went back and forth on, and I've been hitting hard on the, on the Missouri Valley angle. Um, I'm going to give you two. Uh, one Missouri Valley that I really want to keep an eye on is Northern Iowa and Illinois State. Both are top 20 teams. Look at that. Keep an eye out because I think three teams from Missouri Valley get on get in. Both, one of the, both those teams have one loss. It's pretty much a loser out game for a playoff. And then the CAA gets started. Um, so I'm going to be watching Friday night. Albany in New Hampshire, number 13 versus number 14. Albany, one and a half point favorites on the road in New Hampshire. That's got to be cold. So, yeah, two games. Watch out. We got CAA and Missouri Valley on deck. Alex Bonzer. So, I've never been more vitally interested in the entire education system of North Dakota as this weekend. Um, I'm very interested. I can't decide whether I'm more curious to see whether uh, North Dakota continues to perform or. NDSU continues to underperform. So I'll be taking paying attention to both of those games for sure um, because um, it could mean something. It could just be a COVID blip both directions. We don't know, but I'll, I'll be along for the ride regardless. Dammer? Those are exactly the games I was going to call out. Uh, the Dakota Bowl between North and South Dakota could honestly be to determine the best team in the Dakotas, which is insane. Uh, North Dakota State looked not like North Dakota State. Now, Zeb Noland played poorly, uh, to put it lightly, but they do uh, they do take on the fighting Bobby Petrinos uh, this week, and they absolutely could lose. And we could see North Dakota State 2-2 two and two win was the last time anybody saw that. Marcel? I'm going to continue my biggest guy supremacy approach, and I'm going to tune into a little bit of Eastern Washington NAU. It's research for us next week. Because we play NAU in, sorry, in yeah, Flagstaff. I want to say Flagstaff, but I felt like that couldn't be the name. But yeah, we play NAU in Flagstaff next week. Uh, Lance Hartzler, friend of the pod, has said Keandre Woodty, new quarterback at NAU, looks like he can run, looks like he can throw a deep ball, but cannot really do anything else. So I'm curious to see what that looks like. And I, I just want to, I don't think Barrier is going to miss as many as he did miss against Idaho. Uh, against a team like NAU, so I want to see some points. Yeah, and for me, it's it's simple, baby. I want Idaho to win. I want Missouri State to beat NDSU. I want the Petrino brothers to be a combined 4-0 this spring. Petrino ball. It's a must-watch until they lose. And that is our FCS games that we'll be keeping an eye on when we're not watching our Vandals. 
Corner Missouri school State takes. It, Missouri State is a twenty point dog this weekend. I ooh, money might be there. Uh, corner stool takes. Points. Does anybody have one? I think that's how we'll uh, do these going forward. Uh, the Vandals are making the playoffs and they're the best team in the Big Sky I've ever seen in my life. No, um, Mike Beaudry says he's the best quarterback in the Big Sky. Um, if Eric Berrier is the standard bearer of that, I, we'll see. Um, I, I think Idaho's in a good spot moving forward. And yeah, I think I, I'm predicting we're making the playoffs right now. I'm calling it in the bag, making the playoffs. That's my corner stool take. Marcel, you got one? No big gripes yet, man. So I'll uh, I'll keep my powder dry. My my rant is uh, I would like to apologize to the boatmans, uh, to the hammers, to Trey Weed's parents that were behind me from Eastern Washington. Awesome, I kept Rico. my it, it, well, he was gone by the time I uh, <laughs> uh, the, I was very professional there for a while, uh, and then those last six minutes. I kind of went like a crazy person without saying I saw red. It, it seems fitting in this game. I got into that game in the last six minutes to the point where I think everybody around me was like, this person is a crazy person. So I'd like to apologize to everybody. Uh, but I also want to take credit that uh, I am probably the reason we were able to come up with those stops. So, you know, the wind's on me. Uh, hammer down. 30 to 90 seconds. What did we say in this episode you loved, hated, or anything you want to talk about? Um, I don't think we pointed out the fact that Cody Hawkins was absolutely terrible at being a quarterback. So his father is doubling down on making him the offensive coordinator. Um, honestly, when I saw that for the first time, I thought, what in the damn hell are you doing? Your kid got you fired from Colorado. You're, you're really going to risk this job. Where are you going to go after UC Davis? If you get fired from UC Davis, if you have three losing seasons in four years, you're not going even to the fan controlled football league. You're done, dude. Like what the hell are you doing? But Hey, I guess if I was in a position to put my kid somewhere like starting quarterback at a big sky school for two years, I'd probably do the same thing if I didn't think there were any repercussions for it. So that's my take. We should have really hammered him on that, but you know, that's kind of the thing in, in Idaho sports. We don't talk about nepotism a whole lot. All right, time for closing the bar. You guys know how to find all of us. It's a waste of time. We're running long. But Alex, how can they find you if they want to interact with you? Uh, I'm active on FCS Fans Nation. Sorry, my Twitter has not been um, not been what it should be maybe at this point in my <laughs> millennial life. Um, but uh, definitely hang around there on RSS CFB. Um, it's been a fun time. A lot of places to see FCS uh, news these days, especially since it's the only football going on. Yeah. Um, we will be joining you guys live. Sounds like we're all probably not going to the game this weekend, so probably be a little bit sooner. I was, but after the roads last weekend, I am fact. I am out on spring football for the future of the FCS. That was miserable getting up the goat trail uh, this weekend, so I'm out. Uh, I'm taking a break. See you guys in Moscow, Southern Utah. We have NAU next week on Tuesday if you watch us live on YouTube or normally where you find this podcast on Thursdays. But come join us live. It was really fun from the Corner Club last weekend. We had like 85 watches or something crazy. So uh, it was – thank you guys. Thank all of you. We are sorry that the volume was terrible. Something to work on. Our first episode was terrible, and it's only gotten better from there. That's why you're all here now. Um that's it. It's time for the best band in all the land, Santa Vado, to play us out. Go Vandals. I did have a quick caveat. Oh. Brian, did you have a basketball comment? Yeah, just, just real quick for listeners, our Montana games got canceled this week. We're not doing live episodes anyway, but that means in not too long, Dallas and I will be closing the book after Idaho loses in the first round of the Big Sky Tournament. If we're allowed to play, we don't know if we are because the Montana games were canceled for COVID purposes. We don't know if that – is going just, to be a two-week just window. Call it a wrap. Just call it a wrap. You know. So. Send well, it. No, we're I'm with well, look. We gotta this. close. We gotta close the book on the season. There's some. Yeah. There's some context we gotta throw in, and then we get cover the hell two out games. Of in a, we cover two games in a row. Call it there. That's the win. That's a dub in my opinion. Let's get out. See in the. See in the yeah. Ball. Wait. Shout out to the men's basketball team for getting their first win of the season. Oh Send yeah. It. On Dallas's birthday. Perfect. On birthday. Dallas's birthday. Hey, he's supposed to. Uh, he owes you guys something <laughs> if you listen to the basketball <laughs> podcast. I'm not saying it on this show because this is the classy show. <laughs>
<laughs> All right. Chris, do you want to do you want to send us off again? Yeah. Best band on the land. Go Vandals. Go Vandals.